Hello, everybody. This is Jerry Paulson. Um, we, I think, seem to have lost Barb Gottlieb, but um, I, so I think I'm going to uh, go ahead and get started. I want to um, thank you all for joining in this conference call sponsored by Physicians for Social Responsibility. I'm Jerry Paulson. I'm the director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. And I've been um, a longtime member of PSR. The um, Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment is, uh, is one of um, 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units. And I'll cover that um, in some more detail in a minute. To unmute your line, so I'll press star six more in a or about, pound six. Um, the pediatric uh, um, environmental health specialty units. The Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. Hello, this is Jerry Paulson. Hello, this is Jerry Paulson. Hi, Jerry. This is Celia Janicek. Okay, are you hearing me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I have I'm been hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. There seems to be some difficulty. Um, sometimes I'm getting through and not other times not. So um, right. let me go ahead and um, uh, uh, start um, the the conference call all over again. Barb um, seems to be having um, some problems uh, as well, and so I'll get things started. Um, as I, uh, I'm Jerry Paulson. I'm the director of the Mid Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, um, one of ten pediatric environmental health uh, specialty units. Uh, in the country, and I'm also a very uh, longtime member of Physicians for Social Responsibility and glad to be working with um, PSR to talk about uh, the potential health impacts of natural gas extraction using high volume slick water hydraulic fracturing from long laterals. The um, Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment is one of 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units. We are indirectly funded by the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry and by the Environmental Protection Agency. And they ask me to tell you that they don't screen what I say and I do not speak for um, either of those agencies. And I will add parenthetically that they may well disagree with some of what I have to say. Um, I'm going to talk about the process of uh, unconventional gas extraction, and I prefer that phrase to the word fracking because, as I will explain as we go forward, I believe that the potential health impacts uh, extend beyond just um, the hydraulic fracturing part of the process and are issues that need to issues that need to be um, considered from other steps in the in the process we'll talk about some of the toxicants that are both used in the process as well as derived from the process and look at what um, is known and what we can hypothesize as potential health problems from the process. Unconventional gas extraction is an issue many places here in the United States. 
Um, the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment covers Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, the District of Columbia, and Pennsylvania. So we certainly have active unconventional gas extraction going on in Pennsylvania and in West Virginia. The um, state of Mar the governor of the state of Maryland has so far um, blocked unconventional gas extraction through an executive order. Uh, there, is, there are discussions. There is a gas shale gas play um, actually underneath the eastern part of Virginia. Um, so there are other parts of my region, and as you can see from this map, other parts of the United States where uh, this issue uh, is either currently going on or where it may develop. Beyond the United States, as you can see on the left hand, uh, right hand side of the image in front of you, uh, there are a number of shale gas plays um, throughout Europe, uh, China, South America, um, a few places in Africa, and in Australia. So this has the potential to be a global um, public health issue in addition to being an issue here in the U.S. One of the questions that often gets asked is, we have so many regulations, environmental regulations in this country, why isn't unconventional gas extraction more closely regulated than it is? And there are a number of um, laws that either when they were originally written or as they have been amended over the years, have exempted either specifically unconventional gas extraction or um, have exempted oil and gas recovery in general from um, the regulations that are created underneath those laws. If we go back to the original environmental law here in the United States, the National Environmental Policy Act in 1970, um, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 removed the regulation of several gas and oil related activities from NEPA. Think back um, to 2005, who was the president, who was the vice president. Remember that the vice president serves as the president of the Senate. Um, and you can understand perhaps why the Energy Policy Act of 2005 was passed. The Clean Air Act was originally passed in 1970. Um, and it exempts some oil and gas wells and sometimes pipelines, compressors, and pump stations from some of its oversight. And specifically in 1991 was um, amended to remove hydrogen sulfide from the list of hazardous air pollutants. Hydrogen sulfide is often co-located underground with, un with uh, natural gas and so is, um, because of its foul odor, a pollutant that's particularly noxious to the people who live in these areas, but yet it is not um, able to be regulated. <laughs> Clean Water Act was passed in 1972, and then in 1978 it was um, modified to exempt oil and gas production from a permit program for um, storm water runoff and then further amended again in 2005 to redefine sediment from uh, gas and oil production as de facto not pollutants. Safe Drinking Water Act, again um, passed in the 70s and again modified by the Energy Policy Act of 2005, this time specifically exempting um, hydraulic fracturing from Safe Drinking Water Act oversight. RICRA, which the Resource, Recovery, uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which covers in many instances the disposal of um, solid and hazardous waste, but in the 80s, Congress exempted oil fuel waste, so that certainly includes unconventional gas and oil extraction, and the EPA delegated um, those responsibilities to the states, and so we have a total hodgepodge of coverage. CERCLA, or the Superfund law, exempts benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene 
if they are produced um, through oil or gas extraction. So these toxic chemicals, which would be um, regulated in other industrial settings, are not regulated under CERCLA. And in addition, um, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA, excludes natural gas, natural gas liquids. Um, sometimes when the gas is recovered from underground, it is mixed with um, organic liquids, so natural gas liquids, liquefied natural gas, and um, unrelated to what we're talking about tonight, since synthetic gas. And then um, under the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act of 86, oil and gas facilities um, were uh, not required to report toxic releases. So that gives you some understanding of the limitations that the federal government has in trying to regulate this industry. Now let's talk about what actually happens during unconventional gas extraction. First and foremost, why are we talking about unconventional as opposed to conventional? If you look at um, this image, you can see I've split it and on the right-hand side is an image that refers to um, conventional gas extraction. Basically, you have a, um, a collection of gas, it could be oil, but gas um, in a big pocket underneath the ground, and you can stick a pipe into it and suck it out, and that's fairly easy. On the left-hand side of the image, you see um, a layer of rock, shale rock, that um, has the gas or the oil, depending upon which part of the country you're in here in the U.S., locked up into tiny little pores. Think of shale like a sponge that you might have in your kitchen counter, on your kitchen counter, except that it's made of rock. And in each of those little cavities in the sponge is gas and oil, or oil. So if you drill a single hole into that sponge, you're not going to get um, a lot of product out. But if, as you can see in the diagram, you gr drill down, then turn the drill bit so that it moves horizontally, and then set off explosions in that horizontal portion, you are, in essence, crushing a lot of ra rock in situ, and then you get commercially viable volumes of gas or oil recovered. The industry says that um, uh, hydraulic fracturing has been going on for 50 or more years, and it's not really a new process. That's only partly true. The vertical stimulation of rock layers has been going on for a long time, what you see on the right-hand side of this image. So um, people have drilled vertical holes and uh, set off explosives and recovered gas or oil. But what is new and very different is what you see on the left-hand side of this image, a vertical hole followed then or extended by a horizontal hole um, and um, going out for as long as one mile. So they may be drilling down five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand feet vertically, turning the drill and then going out. Um, up to a mile in the horizontal direction. Among other things, when the fluid is pumped down to crush um, the rock and um, break it up and, uh, and keep uh, the little pores that have been created open, um, this horizontal drilling requires much, much greater volumes of fluid and much higher pressures than would otherwise be the case. There are a number of steps in the total process of unconventional gas extraction, pad construction, drill setup, the drilling itself, the hydraulic fracturing, the natural gas extraction, and then ultimately when the well does run dry, uh, what's supposed to happen is well decommissioning and land restoration. 
Um, that hasn't happened very much in terms of the unconventional gas wells because they're all so new, although I think we certainly have reason from other um, oil production, uh, uh, mining, coal mining situations, other extractive industries where we do have to be worried about whether the land restoration will be done um, in a way that uh, proves satisfactory. I've typed the drilling, hydraulic fracturing, and natural gas extraction in red because those are the processes that I see as most um, risky to the public health. So um, the pad construction, this image shows the beginning of the construction of a drill pad in what was once a farm field, and you can still see um, the rows that were uh, plowed before this pad was uh, created. And the other thing to notice is a road because you have to bring equipment to this pad, you have to bring supplies to this pad, you have to bring um, people to this pad, and then you have to take wastes off of the pad. So the, the, um, this basically creates a road network, um, and you'll see more detail in another photograph in a moment, a road network in an area that's never had a road network before. This impoundment, um, I'm sorry, this, um, this drill pad contains an impoundment pound. Um, an impoundment pound. And some of the more recently constructed drill sites are doing away with impoundment ponds. Um, that's good because that decreases the risk of leakage from the ponds. Basically, if they don't exist, they can't leak. But there are still many um, uh, pads that, that exist that have these ponds and still some new ones that are being built with ponds. So this gives you a sense of what can happen to a landscape. These are photographs uh, taken in Washington County, Pennsylvania. And you can see that road network that I mentioned a moment ago connecting the various um, pads. You have to have multiple pads close together because if you're drilling, say, in that pad that's in the, um, the uh, upper right-hand uh, cleared area, and you can drill down vertically but then come out for a mile, well, then you need somewhere two miles away where you can drill vertically and then go out for a mile to um, not have the two drill bores meet, but still to make sure that you've crushed as much rock underground as you possibly can. So that's the reason why you see multiple drill pads set up where shale gas recovery is being done, not only do they drill to the right, as you can see in this split image on the left-hand side, but of course they are drilling out towards you to the left and back into the plane of the image. Or if you look at it another way, on the left-hand side, if you were to look from above, it looks like a flower or a daisy bloom or something like that, where from a single well in this um, image, they've drilled four, a single pad, they've drilled four wells, turned them in four different directions to go out. The map on the right-hand side of this image is uh, part of Dallas, Texas. You can see, I hope, the little triangles in that map. That's where the drill pads are. And then the parallel colored lines are where the drill bores have been placed. And what you can see is that they are basically trying to chew up as much rock underground to cover as much of that area as they possibly can um, through the process of the horizontal drilling and then the hydraulic fracturing. This picture shows a um, drill pad after the pad construction is complete. A drill rig has been set up. You can see a number of trailers that are used um, for workers, offices, and um, things like that. And then there are a number of pieces of equipment, storage tanks um, for chemicals and sand, depending upon the types of process uh, they're using on the pad. There may be water recycling tanks. These are huge um, uh, 
tanks that are the size of 55-foot-long um, trailers and things like that. Uh, and there are a lot of diesel generators, both in terms of the generator, the um, diesel engines that run the drill, and then the diesel engines that run the pumps to pump the fracking fluid down, um, diesel engines to create electricity to um, run the lights and keep the um, other machinery, uh, equipment, computers, and whatnot in the trailers working and all that sort of thing. Depending upon what state this unconventional gas extraction is going on in, um, the setback, the distance between how uh, a home and where a drill pad can uh, be created is variable. And in some states, it just can be as small as about 300 feet. Um, this is a picture that was taken in Pennsylvania a couple of years ago. And you can see some homes in these circles. These are not. Um, little three-bedroom bungalows. Um, these are pretty good-sized homes. And you can see how close the well pad is and the size of the well pad relative to the size of the residential property. So um, important to keep that in mind from the standpoint of lights that are sometimes on these sites to run them 24 hours a day. The amount of noise that goes on 24 hours away does not provide um, much space between the homes and the noise. And if there's leaks or explosions or things like that, the homes are very close. So the, the drilling itself, I think, presents primarily an occupational health hazard. The drilling itself um, does entail some fluid to lubricate the drill as it goes through the ground. Um, and unless there's an explosion on the pad, that drilling fluid is not, doesn't usually escape the confines of the pad. So the chemicals that are mixed in it, things that may dissolve in the drilling fluid while it's underground and then it comes back above ground, those things certainly do present hazards to the workers, but not quite so much to the public, except in um, one situation. And that is, what do you do with this drilling mud after you've finished drilling the hole? And in many instances, the mud is buried on the pad site, and that assumes that that mud is going to sit there undisturbed forever. Um, and never going to contaminate anybody whose home 100 years from now is built on top of it or if it springs a leak or who knows what. So that does present some public health concern. I want you to take a few minutes, please, and look at this diagram in some detail. Let's start over on the left-hand side of the diagram, up at ground level. You can see some trucks, and this represents trucks that are used to bring um, water or chemicals to the site. Pipe also needs to be brought to the site. Workers need to be brought to the site. And um, sand or other uh, materials to act as propens need to be brought to the site. So all in all, um, uh, there can be literally thousands of truck trips um, to bring all the materials to the site, take people off the site when they leave, and to take waste away from the site. The second um, truck represents those generators, the pumps that are used to pump the fluid down underground at extremely high pressure. This image shows the drilling rig having been removed, so there's just the top of the well. The pit is next to the well. And then the tanker truck that's to the right, this is a tanker truck that would be used to take waste materials away from the site. The gas is partly processed either on site or very near to um, the site in condenser stations. And then um, uh, pump the other chemicals besides the methane are separated. And they may be sold. They may, in fact, be more valuable than the methane. And then the methane, which is, of course, the natural gas, is put into pipes which travel underground all over the United States and delivered to market. The gas is not taken off site in tanker trucks. 
if you look in the center of the image, the well um, goes down in this particular image to an area that's more than 7,000 feet below ground. At around the 7,000 foot, the 6,000 foot level, they start to turn the bore to the right, and then it becomes almost horizontal within the shale lever, uh, layer. The um, end of this bore is closed off and uh, or rather um, explosives are put in the end of the bore and then more proximally it's closed off. That explosion is detonated creating small fissures um, in the rock and then that's done serially moving back up the well bore. So if you look in the enlarged um, image just above, that creates fissures sand, sometimes um, polypropylene beads, et cetera, uh, are used as what's called in this um, uh, technology propens to keep those cracks open. For those of us in the health professions, think of a stent um, that keeps an artery open. And that allows the gas then to flow into the pipe and back up uh, to the surface. And we'll come back to various parts of this image uh, over the next few minutes as I talk more and more about what's going on. When the unconventional gas process was first introduced, at least here um, in the east, I think people first started to worry actually about water pollution, and I am going to talk about water pollution um, in a moment. But I actually think that air pollution may be a greater problem than the water pollution in terms of large scale um, exposure to human populations. So again, you've got these hundreds, maybe even thousands of truck trips bringing equipment, people, and supplies to the pads. They're diesel trucks with the attendant particulate and, um, and volatile organic compound pollutants that we know from diesel engines, whether they're on the highway, whether they're in a city, or whether they are in these rural areas that have um, uh, all of a sudden basically become an industrial zone as a result of the uh, implementation of this process in a rural area. Um, you've got the trucks taking uh, the waste material off. So you've got the precursors basically for the formation of ozone, which obviously is um, a lung uh, hazard. You've got the volatile organic compounds. You've got the particulate matter. In fact, in one valley in Wyoming, where the only industry is unconventional gas extraction and where there are relatively few human beings, they now have uh, ozone alert days directly as a result of the unconventional gas extraction. The numbers on this slide that you see in front of you now are numbers that were used by EPA to do some estimates. And people have said that, well, 5 million gallons is a low estimate of the volume of water brought in a single truckload to a frac site. And therefore, that inflates the number of truck trips. I, I don't know how much we might want to quibble with that or not. And the same thing in terms of, I'm sorry, 3,000 gallons per truck for a total of 5 million gallons. And then 2,000 pounds per truck for the propent for a total of a million and a half pounds of propent. The point that I want to make here is whether you're bringing in 3,000 gallons per truckload, 5,000 gallons per truckload, you need between 1 and 10 million gallons of water each time a single well is fractured. There can be up to four wells, five wells, six wells on a pad, and each individual well can be fractured up to about 10 times. So no matter how much they're bringing per truckload, how much water they're bringing for truckload, per truckload, it still takes a whole lot of truckloads and a whole lot of diesel exhaust to get that water there. Same thing with the propent. And um, another thing to think about, the pipe that is put down underground comes in 31 and 48 foot sections. 
So let's just assume that a given well is using 48 feet, foot sections. And they're drilling down five to 7,000 feet vertically, turning the drill horizontally and going out another, <coughs> excuse me, another mile or so. And they're doing that on four or five um, drills on the same pad. And at 48 feet per section of pipe, that's going to require a heck of a lot of truck trips to bring that pipe uh, to the well pad. Another source of air pollution are those ponds when they are still being used. This is a picture of a very large impoundment pond. And one of the things that I've labeled in this picture um, are the misters. So as health professionals, think about nebulizer. And you know that nebulizers um, can uh, move not only liquids, but the chemicals that are dissolved or suspended in those liquids. We use them obviously all the time for bronchodilation for people with asthma or other um, pulmonary problems, except that these misters would be nebulizers that are literally the size of a small house. And so they are putting large volumes of, um, of uh, vapor into the air. Anything that's dissolved in the vapor, anything that's suspended in the vapor is also going to go um, into the air. And depending upon the prevailing wind pattern, then uh, the area downwind will get the fallout from uh, the chemicals that are contained in this impoundment pond as the misters are used to decrease the volume um, that may ultimately need to be taken off site and processed. We're doing unconventional gas extraction. We as a nation uh, have decided to do unconventional gas extraction to get methane. And um, if methane were the only thing um, underground, um, the equation about the pollution might be different. We might still have health concerns, but, but clearly the equation would be different. But it almost never is pure methane underground. In some places, actually, there's relatively little methane. There may be much more benzene or toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene. I mentioned hydrogen sulfide. Um, and when um, the gas first starts to come back up from underground, uh, it is not captured. And it may actually be intentionally released for several days before it starts to get captured. And then even once it's captured and put into the compressors and the drying stations and ultimately then into the pipelines, there are leakages of methane and these other constituents all throughout that process. If the methane or um, other chemicals are flared, which is just another word for being burned in the open air, then, of course, that burning produces its own carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, particulates, volatile organic compounds, oxides of nitrogen, oxides of sulfur. So flaring, when it's being done, um, is also a source of air pollution. Um, in addition, depending upon what part of the country the um, natural gas is recovered from, some pockets of natural gas, some of the shale plays, uh, better word than pockets, but some of the shale plays will have higher radon uh, levels in them than other parts of the country. And while the radon is relatively short-lived, um, if there's only a short distance, maybe 100 or 200 miles from the wellheads to the ultimate end use site, then that radon may still um, have not decayed by the time it gets to homes and factories. And particularly when it's being burned in homes, um, may uh, expose um, the people in the homes, whether it's the furnace, uh, uh, gas stoves, uh, gas fireplaces, et cetera, to the radon, because obviously as an element, radon is not burned in those flames. This is just a, um, uh, an image to uh, describe and remind you all about ozone formation. 
uh, oxides of nitrogen, volatile organic compounds plus energy from the sun uh, leads to the formation of uh, ozone at ground level. And um, on this slide, you can see on the left-hand side some of the health effects uh, that are associated with ozone, and um, on the right-hand uh, column, some of the health effects associated uh, with particulate matter. And certainly for um, children or adults with um, asthma, um, adults with emphysema and other chronic lung diseases, both um, ozone and particulate matter can create uh, exacerbation of uh, asthma. There is evidence that children who spend a lot of time outdoors in communities with high ambient ozone levels are at greater risk of developing de novo asthma um, related to that or associated with, I'm sorry, associated with um, that high level of ozone in those communities. And one thing that's probably more pertinent to um, adult populations than the pediatric population uh, is the association between particulate matter exposure and um, stroke or myocardial infarction. The six cities study by Dockery et al. and a number of other um, research studies that have uh, been done since those studies all clearly document that whether you look at admissions to emergency rooms, admissions to intensive care units, or deaths from myocardial infarction or stroke, they all correlate with um, the particulate matter 24 hours before the date of admission or death. So it's not something that happens instantaneously, but there's a lag time of about 24 hours. There's not a lot of research on unconventional gas extraction per se, but we certainly have research showing associations between prenatal exposure to airborne benzene and adverse birth outcomes. Um, one study in Texas uh, showing an association um, between levels of maternal exposure to benzene and uh, neural tube defect in their offspring. Um, another study from Texas looking at exposure to benzene um, and other hazards air pollutants and ultimate uh, development of leukemia in children, and then a study done in France looking at maternal exposure to airborne benzene measured, um, or the proxy was uh, how far the woman lived during her pregnancy from major roadways, and showing that um, women who live closer to major roadways and therefore were presumed to have a higher benzene exposure uh, delivered children with smaller heights, weights, and head circumferences. There have been now a few studies specifically um, related to unconventional gas extraction. Um, Eileen Hill um, did um, a, a study that's been published as a working paper, and I reviewed it uh, for the peer-reviewed literature. I certainly would have recommended that it be um, accepted for publication, and my hope is that she will ultimately submit it for um, publication in a peer-reviewed journal. But she looked at um, women <coughs> living in Pennsylvania um, in two situations. Some were living near an active well, and some were living in an area where permits had been um, uh, approved for well drilling, but the drilling had not um, yet uh, started. And the babies whose mothers were living closer to the active wells were more likely to be small for gestational age, again, have small height, weight, and head circumference relative to how many weeks of pregnancy at which they were born. As you can recognize, there are a lot of potential for intervening variables. I think that Hill did a reasonable job of um, trying to control for as many of those variables um, as uh, she could. Um, but you know, this is not a definitive study, but certainly an important study. And then in a study just recently published out of Colorado, um, Mackenzie and um, colleagues also looked at um, 
how close women lived to active unconventional gas extraction. They looked at uh, the results of 125,000 um, pregnancies from 1996 to 2009. This was uh, all birth certificate data. These were not um, independently examined um, children. And they found that, <coughs> excuse me, they found that Moms who um, lived closer to the active wells, their kids had a 1.3 relative risk for being born um, with a heart defect and that there was a dose response relationship. There was a 2.0 relative risk for kids being born with neural tube defects, but interestingly, no dose response. And the other thing that's interesting is that um, in this particular study, they did not show a significant odds ratio for low birth weight, so that's different from what Hill found. And I think, you know, it's not unusual in an area that's newly being explored uh, scientifically that all the studies don't line up, and we'll learn more over time and have a better understanding, perhaps, of why some studies show one thing and other studies show another. Talking now about the water pollution, um, if you look at the very top of the ground level in this diagram, you can see a little blue line down um, somewhere around 100 feet or so, and that's the water table in this diagram. And the water table for um, uh, wells is usually somewhere between 100 and about 1,000 feet. And again, the question then comes, well, how could, how could natural gas or other convention other chemicals from the unconventional gas extraction move through over a mile's worth of rock and, uh, and soil to get into the water table. And um, well, maybe that does or does not happen from down below, but we know that there are many instances where the well bore and the pipes around the well bore fail, and those pipes do go directly through the water table, and so that is one potential mechanism for contamination. And then if these pits overflow um, or spring a leak, then the contamination of, ground, of surface water can occur. We don't know what's in unconventional gas extraction fracking fluid. We know some of the chemicals that are included, and it's um, depending upon the database that you look at, there are several hundred distinct chemicals on this particular um, image. I've only shown the top six or seven that were collected um, in some data uh, created by one of the congressional committees a couple of years ago. And when you look at it as a, as a health professional or a scientist, you can see that in some ways in our world, some of these chemicals are not all that uncommon. Um, methanol, isopropanol, um, crystalline silica or sand, um, <clears throat> sodium hydroxide. These are chemicals that are also used in um, hydraulic fracturing fluid. But here's a different way to display that same information. It's a little longer list than the one above. And if you look at the middle column, what that indicates is in terms of, for example, methyl alcohol <clears throat> or methanol, if the Clean Air Act were um, regulating unconventional gas extraction, then the methanol would be regulated as a hazardous air pollutant. Xylene, if the Safe Drinking Water Act were uh, regulating unconventional gas extraction, would be regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And then you can also see that diesel, naphthalene, formaldehyde, sulfuric acid um, are known carcinogens. The industry does provide some information about what's been put down in those holes on a website called Frack Focus. This is done in a post hoc kind of way, and um, information is supplied by brand name, and so you often don't know what the constituents of those brand name chemicals were. <clears throat> As I've just indicated, we do have to be worried about the chemicals that are put in. But we also have to be worried about chemicals that were stored naturally underground and now come back as these fluids come back to the surface. Shale was laid down as the bed of an ancient ocean, 
And so there are all sorts of other chemicals down there that used to be in the ocean, a lot of brines, uh, sodium salts, potassium salts, um, various chlorides, bromides, and again, I mentioned um, the radionuclides. There are clear cases where tap water has been well documented to be contaminated by uh, methane, and if you go on YouTube, you can probably see a thousand or more anecdotes about water being contaminated with methane. But in terms of actual research, this work done by Osborne et al. from Duke University is among the most important um, research documenting that uh, well water wells that are close to gas wells, if you look down at the uh, x-axis, are more likely to contain methane, if you look at the y-axis, um, than wells, water wells that are far away from um, the gas wells. And the other thing that Osborne et al. did that was so important is, remember, when grass clippings um, deteriorate, when leaves fall in the forest and deteriorate, when a deer dies in the woods and the carcass um, decays, all of those processes produce uh, methane as well. So could that be where the methane in this well, these wells come from? And then it's not the quote fault unquote of the unconventional gas extraction. Well, what um, Osborne et al. did was um, you can use carbon, uh, radioactive carbon proportions and methane that was created eons ago has different uh, radioactive carbon proportions than does methane created more recently and they documented that this was ancient um, methane. We are doing unconventional gas extraction because we want to burn methane to produce electricity because burning methane to produce electricity, that single process does produce less carbon dioxide than does burning coal for the same amount of electricity and therefore um, we're decreasing greenhouse gases. But the methane itself when released to the atmosphere is a more potent greenhouse gas than the carbon dioxide. And as I mentioned in the initial um, day or two of flowback, up to several million cubic feet per day of methane is released to the atmosphere along with the leaking that occurs in a number of other parts of this process. And Anthony Ingrafia, a professor of engineering at Cornell University, has done some calculations and he believes that on net the process of unconventional gas extraction actually worsens climate change and does not um, decrease or mitigate um, what's going on in terms of climate change today. The other health impact associated with unconventional gas in, uh, extraction are those adverse outcomes associated with stress. You've got a 24-hour day, seven day a week during the drilling extraction, uh, hydraulic fracturing extraction, and to some extent flowback uh, over years. Um, You've got a 24-hour day, seven-day week industrial process that's noisy, smelly, um, at least when the drilling and the fracking are going on, you have lights on. And that causes some um, disrupted sleep, kids can't study as well, adults don't drive their cars safely, and things like that. And just to give you a sense of some of the noise involved in um, this process, uh, 55 decibels um, is enough to be annoying. School performance is adversely affected by um, noise at 70 decibels and above, and sleep can be disturbed at 35 or more decibels. And at 50 feet, wells produce 80 to 90 decibels. At 500 feet, they're still producing 60 to 68 decibels. And even at 60, uh, at 1,000 feet, um, the Bureau of Land Management calculated that the noise from the wells can be um, up to 63 decibels, so above the annoyance level and certainly above, above the sleep disturbance um, level. And we know there's growing evidence that um, the uh, stress is a cumulative factor that adversely impacts on cardiovascular, immune, and other systems. 
Um, so let me um, kind of conclude here. I think that we have documented um, many toxic chemicals that are either used in or produced by the unconventional gas extraction process as a whole, not just the fracking, and that through um, air and water, um, we have some documented and um, some certainly very possible routes of exposure um, to bring those chemicals to the bodies of human beings. As a pediatrician, I worry a lot about kids. They live longer, and so if it takes a long time for an adverse outcome to occur, they're going to be around long enough to experience that. They drink more and breathe more per unit of body mass than an adult does, so if the water that they drink or the air that they breathe is contaminated, they're going to get a higher dose. And their livers and kidneys at certain ages at any rate may not be um, as good at detoxifying xenobiotics as um, an adult's liver or kidneys would be. So in conclusion, we don't have really a lot of documentation that there are widespread adverse human health consequences occurring as a result of natural gas extraction using high volume slick water hydraulic fracturing from long laterals from clustered multi-well pads. But as I said, there are a number of hazardous chemicals used in and produced by these um, processes and a number of um, plausible or known routes of exposure. I think that the drilling and energy companies must demonstrate that they can do this in a way that minimizes the threat to human and ecosystem health, that they should, as um, some of the companies in the 60s and 70s where there, when there were major concerns about air pollution from uh, automobiles and other sources created the Health Effects Institute, which has been a very effective mechanism for um, producing very credible, reliable air pollution research. Up in Canada, the Western Interprovincial Scientific Studies Association has looked at health outcomes associated with all sorts of um, oil and gas extractive industries, and that is also partly funded by the industries, but is able to maintain its independence and assure the objectivity of the science and things like that. It is the industry's responsibility to reveal a full description of all the chemicals used and the quantities um, prospectively, and it should not be the responsibility of the public to fund the research in a post hoc kind of way. So um, I think now that I will um, invite you uh, to um, type in questions in the chat box um, down on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Please address the questions to all participants, and I will um, uh, uh, try and answer them as um, they come in. Um, let me see if... Um, Barb Gottlieb um, has been able to rejoin the uh, discussion and see if she wants to say a few words. Barb, are you there? Okay. Well, I will um, continue um, on then. Um, so the first question is, oh, hello, Barb. Okay. Sorry that you didn't get to say your stuff at the beginning, but go right ahead. Well, thank you very much, and hello and good evening to everyone. I, um, I actually have been with you all along, but uh, we did have technical difficulties, and so I wasn't able to, um, to speak at the beginning. Um, Dr. Paulson, thank you for taking the matter in hand, um, as I, I knew you would and could. Um, uh, I want to say thank you so much. Um, Dr. Paulson is a longtime member of PSR, and we're very proud to, um, to claim you as one of our own. There. We need everybody to mute your lines, please. We're hearing background conversation. Please mute your phones. How? Thank you. Star six. Push star six and mute your phone. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Let me just mention to that unmute your line. Original, press um, star six or pound six. Barb, you're gone again.
All right. Well, um, I think everybody can um, hear me. Um, so even though we're having problems with Barb Gottlieb again, not with Barb, but with the connection to Barb, um, let me go ahead and um, still try and answer some of these questions. What advice would you give someone who is just learning about fracking on how to raise the health concerns associated with this industry? Um, it's a very difficult situation. The industry has a tremendous amount of money for hiring public relations um, people. Um, they um, put out a lot of information that um, uh, puts a glowing picture on the process as being safe and all sorts of benefits in terms of jobs. And, you know, um, we don't um, really have um, the specific data from unconventional gas extraction, but I don't think that should prevent us from extrapolating from um, data uh, from the industrial health literature, um, et cetera, um, to uh, use that information in talking to the communities um, and uh, encouraging legislators, um, town councils, and whatnot um, to uh, prevent uh, this process from um, going on. Um, another question is, um, do you um, think that um, there is a difference between the risks associated with unconventional gas um, and coal bed or coal seam methane type gas, et cetera? Um, I, I don't really know enough about these processes. Um, you know, the methane itself is methane, and as a greenhouse gas, um, it's going to present a risk um, to the planet no matter what process is used to get it out from the ground um, if it's allowed to leak into the atmosphere. And then the rest of it depends on um, what is used, what other chemicals and processes are used. So if the process for um, steam bed methane involves, or coal seam methane rather, coal bed methane, involves some of the same uh, chemicals that hydraulic fracturing involves, then I would say yes. Um, but I don't, don't know um, the details. Somebody wants to know if they can get the charts that I'm showing, and if you go to the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health um, website, which is www.childrensnational, all one word, .org, forward slash M-A-C-C-H-E, that's the website for the Mid-Atlantic Center, if you just Google that, um, there is a presentation very similar to this one um, posted there. And um, uh, you're welcome to um, look at that. Um, let me see. Um, um, so um, I think that we were supposed to um, end this uh, at seven o'clock and so I will um, uh, stop the um, webinar at to this point and again on behalf of myself or and pound six. certainly on behalf of Barb Gottlieb and um, the Physicians uh, for Social Responsibility, um, I thank you very much for uh, dialing in to the webinar tonight. I'm sorry that we had the um, uh, technical difficulties, but hopefully most of you are able to hear most of the time, and I wish you all a, a good evening.